Hello, you're listening or watching DNA Today. We are a genetics podcast and radio show. I'm your host, Kira Deneen. I'm also a certified genetic counselor practicing in the prenatal space. On this show, we explore genetics impact on our health through conversations with leaders in genetics. My guest today is Joe Bakhti, the founder and CEO of QuantGene. And in this episode, we are going to be exploring whole genome or rather whole exome sequencing. We might touch base on whole exome and genome sequencing together. So thank you so much, Joe, for coming on the call here and letting us talk about this specific type of genetic testing. Yeah, Kira, excited to be here. I think it's a tremendously important topic. And of course, quantine paves the way in, in some respects in, in uh, germline and also somatic testing. But I think today's more germline. And yeah, very excited to dive in. So when it comes to whole exome sequencing, for people that maybe haven't heard of this before, if there are students listening, what is whole exome sequencing? So genetic testing started you know, very in a very limited way, focusing on specific variants or maybe specific genes because there was simply no other option to do things because sequencing was very expensive and very complicated to handle. So as you as your listeners probably know, we have 3.3 billion nucleotides on the whole human genome. Uh, of these, roughly 1% are coding, what we call coding uh, genes or coding um, nucleotides to be uh, specific. And they are structured in about... It's actually an interesting topic how many genes we actually have, but we have something around 20 to 21,000 genes that are being used. There are, you know, people say up to 9,000 additional silent genes that are not being used, so that's questionable if they're exome or not. Um, and then you have a vast 99% of the genome is very likely non-coding or at least not being used, not being read, or not being translated into proteins to be most accurate here. And so when we talk about genome, we mean the entire thing, 23 chromosomes, 3.3 billion nucleotides, so ATCGs. Uh, and when we talk about exome, we talk about this 1% of this 3.3 billion, so roughly 30 million nucleotides across roughly 20,000 genes um, that our body actually uses to produce, you know, these 20,000 different proteins. And so basically it's a more cost-effective way if you would have told everyone 10 years ago that it was cost effective, that would have been probably $10 million or something to do a single exome. Uh, nowadays, Quantine is the first company to bring this price below $1,000, including clinical interpretation, uh, which is dramatic. It's a dramatic uh, step change. Um, and that is very different because if you do a BRCA gene panel, for example, we are talking about two genes, two BRCA genes. When we do our exome gene panel, we talk about 20,000 genes. So it's a very different scope. And another thing besides the sequencing costs, you need massive amounts of AI and cloud computing to do the clinical analysis of 20,000 genes if you want to do it cost effectively, not have like a curation scientist work for two years on each sample. Right. So when right. we're looking at just the exome, as you were saying, we're only looking at the genes that are active and we're only looking at the actual genes. So we're not looking at the entire library of our genetic information. So when it comes to actually doing this in the laboratory, what technology is used for this whole exome sequencing? I mean, it's quite an undertaking, as you were saying, there's so much data that comes out of this, but what is the technology that's used to actually get that data? Yeah, there are multiple vendors who specialize in whole exome sequencing kits. So we run on Illumina uh, sequencing machines, Nova Seek uh, 6000 mostly, so the latest iteration of you know, massive parallel sequencing um, machines. And the actual chemistry kits that are being used, you know, we have Kyogen, you have Illumina, you have a bunch of vendors who allow you to take saliva samples, extract the DNA, uh, shear the DNA to the right size amount piece. And then there's a specific technology that allows you to amplify all the material across the exome and then sequence it on the machine. And so it's interesting with that is, you know, as you said, you're like amplifying the DNA, that it's not just read once, but it's read many, many times. So you can see, okay, are we getting that same letter every time at that same location and then compiling all that information? I remember the first time I learned that I was like, oh, they don't just read it once. They're reading it many times. I mean, how many times is it read and compiled in that way? 
So that's very interesting. The deeper you dive into that, the more interesting it gets. So what you, what everyone has to recognize when it comes to sequencing is this is a game of chemistry and statistics. So you cannot just take a piece of DNA and sequence it, right? No one can do that. So what you have to do is you have to massively amplify that piece, uh, or in that case, a lot of pieces uh, across the entire genome, and you have to amplify them so you, they exist many times, hundreds of thousands of times each piece. And then you basically take a pipette and you put it on the flow cell, on the actual cell that reads it out. And that means you, you are entering a statistical game realm, right? So you don't know, okay, you don't know how, how often each fragment or each piece of the DNA, each, uh, each uh, sequence of the DNA is actually existent. You can just do statistics on it, right? If you have a trillion pieces and you take a pipette and the trillion pieces, uh, they contain, you know, maybe... Uh, in average, a thousand times each piece you want to look at, but in average means it's a bell curve. So on the tail end, randomly, some of these pieces only exist a hundred times, and others exist ten thousand times, and you have no control over it. You put it on the flow cell, and the flow cell kind of randomly picks out statistically how much space you give it, right, for that specific uh, patient. So there's something called sequencing depth, and sequencing depth tells you how often, in average you look at each location. And so now it gets a little complicated. So the bottom line is in clinical grade sequencing, you want to, normally you go for 100 to 120 times, 100 to 120 X. That means an average you read 100 to 120 times each location. But of course, why do you do it? You don't need 100 times. No one needs 100 times. You need, you know, 10 times. But to be super safe, you need 20 times. Why do you need more than one? Because if you only do one read, and the read is wrong, which happens in sequencing. It's a laser signal based. Uh, then you might read a T, but it was an A. But if you if you look ten times and you get T T T A G A T T, right at the same location, you say, well, it's a T. So, you know, seventy percent of that is a T. So let's just assume it's a T because it needs to be one or the other. Or it needs to be at least fifty percent one or the other. It depends. And that's how you do it, and then you basically reverse engineer and say, okay, if I need to make sure that all the stuff I'm investigating is at least read 10 times, how often in average do I have to look at it? And the answer is like, well, 100, 120 times, and then you get to a bell curve where, you know, the ones you cover the least are still covered 10 times. And of course, it's all statistics, so you always will miss some. That's very important to understand. Like, in many cases, like there are always cases where some locations will always be less than 10 times, just statistically. And then you have a quality issue and you actually have to mark that. You have to have very advanced software that tells before you give it into a report to a counselor, you have to understand the exact depth that was actually found. So for example, if you found a pathogenic variant, but the BAM file or whatever file you get out of the sequencing machine after processing uh, tells you, well, we only find three copies. Technically, you have to reject it. You have to say, well, that's just not enough. That we so can't we be confident react. with that. And especially if you were saying like it's a pathogenic variant where we say this could actually be harmful towards someone's health. And then you say, well, we really want to make sure we get that right because that could have you know massive impact on that person. Yes, exactly. So you have to, that is why you need very advanced you know, computing capabilities and cloud capabilities to do whole exome. Because you can imagine if you use 30 million locations, and have these little math issues, and you find something that's pathogenic, you need to be able to go back to that individual variant and say, how many copies did we actually read in the sequencing machine? And that answer needs to be correct. And that informs if you can use it or if you have to rerun the sample. And so when it comes to actually ordering whole exome sequencing, I mean, when is it ordered? When in a situation with a patient, is a healthcare provider saying, okay, this is appropriate, we're going to order whole exome sequencing? Well, that is exactly one of the crucial questions where we, we define what is normal and what's not normal. In our opinion, it should always be ordered. And so here we are very controversial, right? A lot of people say, no, don't do it. Don't do the whole exome for random people proactively. Only do it in rare disease cases where we have a phenotype that no one understands and we can't find the solution, but we are kind of have a certain confidence it is, you know, it is, um, it is genetic, and then people don't know what to do, and then they order whole exome. We want to change the paradigm 
so it becomes the default. Because the only reason not to do it for everyone was actually you know, financial reasons, that it was too expensive. What we believe is in the interest of medicine and medical advancement and in the interest of patients, there is no reason not to do it for everyone all the time, as long as you have informed consent and the patient understands the implication of genetic testing and colexome. So what we do at Quanti and Serenity is actually changing that paradigm and try to get more people into whole exome sequencing because there's a tremendous amount of data and information that might be valuable for the patient. And it's a paradigm shift away from reactive medicine towards preventive and proactive medicine. So in reactive medicine, you say, why would I test that? There's no phenotype, there's no issue, so don't test it. In proactive and preventive medicine, well, that's the whole point. We don't want to wait until there is a major problem. We want to see everything before we know what's going on, so we know what's going on on a genetic level. So that's why we believe that there should be a shift to whole exome sequencing, and that's why we made it available um, at a reasonable price and in a preventive, proactive setting. And so thinking about this as, as a preventive setting with, with whole exome sequencing, this is similar to newborn screening where, you know, I can only speak to the U.S., but all babies, unless their parents opt out, are screened at birth for conditions that are very serious. Most of them have treatment that can be life-changing, so early diagnosis is very key. Do you see whole exome sequencing replacing what we're currently doing with newborn screening? Or, I mean, you were talking about consent, too. We can't get a baby's consent for this. So, I don't know. Do you see that being replaced in terms of newborn screening, or am I just too many decades, you know, in the future for that. Well, there are two topics here that are very interesting. Number one, um, minors, right? How do you deal with the ethics question of, of, of generating deep genetic data for minors before they can, before the age of consent? Because you're dealing with a human being and you're dealing with deep insights, very, very deep insights. And is it ethically, you know, defensible to make that decision for another human being without their consent. That is something that is something we have to discuss. It's a complicated question. I don't have a view on that. We listen to many people. Um, it's a difficult question. And, you know, because once you do this for, for a baby, it's it's there. The baby can't say later, okay, let's, I mean, they could say delete it, but can they really delete it? It's in the healthcare system. I'm not sure. Um, so that's a different question. Um, the other question is, you know, do you want to have comprehensive insight and who makes this decision? If you want it, if you decide medically, it's medically actually appropriate, I would recommend it for everyone, but I wouldn't recommend it for people who can't make decisions and I don't want to force them to do it. So I wouldn't recommend it for everyone, but it needs to be the decision of, of that specific patient. And the next question is, okay, who pays for it and who makes these decisions? outside yourself let's say you say okay i want it who is the next decision maker here that is also why we believe at quantum when we launched this thing this year we need to start with a sales payer market we need to say okay that's why we are very aggressive on price where we are very cost conscious and try to make it very affordable so everyone can pay out of pocket for it for a simple reason if you go to insurance or medicare same thing you are suddenly dealing with a decision-making apparatus that is completely disconnected, and I mean that, completely disconnected from your patient interest. You're basically outsourcing the decision either to the government or to privately for-profit companies. I don't know which one is worse, by the way. It's equally bad. It's a toss-up. <laughs> and you are basically giving it either to bureaucrats or bureaucrats who work for profit and so bureaucrats who work for politicians versus bureaucrats who work for profits, so who knows. And they make the decision, well, Kira, you know what? No, we are not going to pay for you. And that is not rooted in a deep you know, evaluation if that's good for you or not. It's a, a deep evaluation if it's good for them or not. And that's why a sales payer system is much more powerful also to advance medicine. Because you say, well, as long as we can find enough customers and make our case with them, and they simply pay, it's between us and you. Can Quantine deliver the quality and provide protection for you? And can you pay Quantine the price that we are asking that hopefully is reasonable? And then we are done. 
there's no third party and they're like, oh, we should also ask the US government what they think or like some random insurance company. And so because if you wait for these guys to make up their minds, you basically have to force them on an economic argument level to do it. And that might take 10, 20 years of clinical trials and, and evidence and all kinds of stuff that they want. That is not the evidence the patient needs or the doctor needs because it's economic evidence. And that's our stance on it. So it's, to your question, it really depends who you're dealing with and what the business model is. And hopefully it's aligned to the patient and not to some other entity. And then it's a question that each individual can decide, you know, do we make a compelling case? Why this is important for you? If we are not compelling, don't do it. If it's compelling, you can just do it. And I would hope eventually that, you know, with all genetic testing, eventually that insurance companies do catch up and say, okay, this testing actually is financially worth it. Unfortunately, as you said, that's kind of how the system works, but financially worth it because preventing a disease and treating it before um, is most of the time less expensive um, than treating it afterwards. Um, so it's kind of, you know, I would hope that, you know, even if we're starting out with this model where people are paying out of pocket for testing that, you know, hopefully insurance companies would start coming around to that. Um, when it comes to, well, uh, yes, for sure, sorry to interrupt, but it's such an important point because it's co our core philosophy here. I think absolutely they should pay for it and we should make them pay for it. But the way to make them pay for it is not to beg them but to create a product in the market that creates enough political pressure uh, to force them to do it. Because that's the only way to really get it done, I think. And when it comes when to the importance of doing whole exome sequencing, I mean, what information are patients getting out of this that can change their health? What are a couple examples of conditions or results where patients can make health choices that are different to help their health overall? Oh, that's a very far-reaching question. Yeah, we could list all day, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, there are like dozens and dozens and dozens of dangerous medical conditions or even hundreds if you include rare diseases uh, that can be found and they can be found to be, uh, you know, dominant or present like in the phenotype that maybe is not expressed yet. So meaning, uh, you know, there are diseases that if you know about it, you have certain metabolic shortcomings, um, you know, the way you metabolize iron, for example, that only um, manifest as, as clinical symptoms when you're 30 or 40, uh, but you can actually take action once you know what it is uh, far earlier, and then you never get the symptoms because you know your body cannot metabolize iron to the extent necessary. Uh, and there are, many, there are like hundreds of these examples. Then there's, you know, uh, pharmacogenomics where you have drug interactions, right? You know your genes are incompatible with certain drugs. So prescription drugs, um, you have higher or lower metabolism for these drugs, which means the dosage you get is the wrong dosage. If you follow FDA requirements or recommendations or approvals for the drug, you have the wrong dosage because you are half or 200% metabolizer of the drug. So you get either overdose or underdose, which can lead to extremely bad things if this is about cancer, for example. Um, so you need to know that too. Um, of course, of course, you have carrier screening aspects, right? If you want to have kids and you, you have self-tested, similar things as discussed before. The insurance normally forces one partner to get the test and not both and then sees if there's a problem. And if there's a problem, then the second partner gets tested and only for specific conditions. It's much more powerful to say, skip it, test both whole exome and you have everything. And that can be tremendously life-changing because you can find things that you will definitely not find in conventional carrier screening. And that can be reproductive you know, choices. So that's the interesting thing about genetics. If you ask, okay, what does it do? And you can go on and on and on and on. And, and, for, and also the reports we are generating, there's, we probably generate, we, we generate reports around the medically actionable targets where it's clear what to do, but they are also thousands, tens of thousands of additional targets that are either unknown or like are not medically actionable, but they inform nutrition. So there's, it's basically an entire treasure trove of the deepest possible insights about yourself that you get from whole exome sequencing. And that treasure trove is not dealt with with a single report or a single session. It's a lifelong thing. So you're generating this thing where you have all your coding genome, your exome sequence and available. 
And then it's an ongoing service to actually connect the latest science with it forever. Like it's, it's an ongoing thing that never ends. Uh, and I think for most people, it's hard to even wrap their heads around genetics when you hear it the first time. But I think once you get it, it's, I think in you know, 10 years, we, have a large share, we will have a large share of the population will not even consider not having the whole genome probably tested at this point. And, and not use it for a one-off report or something, but as an ongoing super data warehouse where you constantly have an AI watching over your genome and connecting it to global science. And every time someone at a random you know, research group in southern Sweden or something finds something out, you, you have it the next minute on your phone and say, like, there is a variant in your genome where a new study has found that you might have problems uh, metabolizing X, Y, Z, and that implies stop eating these things, for example. Yeah, it's. Yeah. I think that's such a great explanation of just how many specific genetic tests that doing a whole genome or whole exome sequencing could replace. That as you were talking about, like carrier screening, that's something as a prenatal genetic counselor I'm offering to patients all day, every day. And, you know, they may have done carrier screening earlier, but it was only for 22 conditions. And I'm offering a panel of hundreds of conditions and all of this, it's like, well, we could replace all that. And you could just have it, this the whole exome sequencing, and then you're pretty much done for genetics. I mean, looking at if someone has their whole exome sequenced and has that data, would that need to be redone later in life? I mean, obviously someone's genetics isn't changing, but the technology does get better. I mean, we were talk we started our conversation talking about like the depth. So how how accurate are those letters that we think that are there in terms of like what comprises of the genes? I mean, do we think that's going to like really improve if someone would need to repeat this testing or do you think no, once you've had it done, that's good for your whole life? I see it more like this. So our technology or the technologies that are now gold standard in the market since like the last two years, they are very, very good. So to your question, I think, of course, no one knows the future. Maybe find something out that we don't even know. Maybe there's a new aspect to the genome. Maybe there's like uh, epigenetics or something that is also important in a hereditary sense. And we are also a liquid biopsy company, so then that's the deep end when you go into actually cancer mutation detection in DNA in the blood and things like that. But that's a whole that's a deeper rabbit hole. But when it comes to germline, in my opinion, you know, it is likely that we have a very, very good solid foundation. And if you do it now, you are done with the exome. And I think what comes next is the genome. So you, in my opinion. If you do a Serenity whole exome sequencing test, you will be fine for three, four years. And what we will do then is repeat the test for whole genome to just catch up with the remaining 99%. Because we know there is stuff going on. It's much more opaque. It's much more difficult. And right now, everything clinic, nearly everything clinically actionable is in the exome. But there's for sure some information in the genome beyond the exome that has some meaning in the introns, right, in the non-coding regions, like who the hell knows, that might be important. And But it's like the 80-20 rule, only that's probably the 95-5 rule. Yeah. The exome gives you yeah. 95. So 1% of the genome gives you 95% of all information that's necessary, but the remaining 5% is spread out over the last 99%, and that we want that information at some point. So to your question, I think short answers, I would predict you're very well suited with whole exome, but in four or five years, we would repeat it with whole genome for everyone just to catch up with the rest. But it doesn't replace, I don't think there will be any new insights on your exome, it's just adding more stuff. Yeah, it's interesting yeah. to see that once, you know, someone has all that data, as you said, they could, you know, go to their psychologist and they're looking to get on a certain medication and then they're looking at that to see, okay, what medications are going to work best with your genetics? What dosage? You know, you're then having a baby later in your life and you're looking at that for your carrier screening results. You start having symptoms for a disorder and you're looking at that and saying, oh, we can actually see that you have a change in this gene that's giving us this diagnosis. So really just like following through someone's life of just all the information that it could provide. Um, you know, in terms of... There, that's because it's such an important point. What Quantine is doing with the gene cloud, where we put your exome into our cloud, of course, super privacy protected, not even insurance or other physicians get to that, but you have the key. 
So you have that in the cloud. From there on, you have this giant treasure trove of data. The number of reports you can generate from that is basically limitless. We are not throwing limitless reports at you. We have a specific initial report. But here's what it does down the road for you in your life. Anytime you need any kind of clinical grade panel for any gene, you can pull it from that cloud within 48 hours. And that is, a, as you know, as a genetic counselor, that's a huge revolution because if you have a cancer patient, pancreatic cancer, and they want BRCA, for example, investigated that has no impact on pancreatic too, um, that might take six weeks or four weeks to order because you need to collect saliva or blood, you need to extract it, you need to run it in the lab, you need to sign it off. All that is already done before you even start because now it's in the cloud. So all you need is pull the the director, uh, the clinical report from the lab director. And so that is a big game changer. And so basically you have then this treasure trove and can constantly dig through it for any reason that comes up. Yeah, that's amazing to have just as a resource, as you said, I mean, when I'm doing genetic testing for patients, most of the waiting for results is you know, getting their sample and then having to ship it off. So usually it's going somewhere in the US and usually it's not right, you know, I'm New York based. So usually it's not right in New York. It's sending out to Utah or California usually. And then you're waiting in the lab to process all that. And, but it only takes a couple of days to actually look at that genetic information and then have it analyzed. So most of the waiting is like in the shipping and the processing and everything. So when it does come to whole exome sequencing, if someone is, you know, doing either saliva or spit, how long does it take for results to come back? What is the turnaround time? Right now, the turnaround time for the first time, like when you actually do the entire thing, is roughly five to six weeks, including report and counseling session. Um, I think we will bring this down in this year to probably four weeks or three weeks or something. But realistically, right now, it's like more six weeks. That's way less than I thought you were going to say. I feel it's been a while since I was in pediatrics, but I feel like it was much longer um, when we were ordering that for patients that had like an undiagnosed condition that I don't want to misspeak. I feel like it was a couple months or something for turnaround time. It used to be it still for many. I mean, what Quanchin did, we have a six year R&D track record now, right? So we built very, very massive cloud and AI systems behind it. So this is not like some random person sitting there and going, <laughs> which it is in most labs. They're literally, there is a person with Google going through your variants and <laughs> there's no fun. So we have a very advanced cloud portal. The AI pre-structures, everything connects dozens and dozens of databases to it, you know, cross checks all the variants and basically pre-digest the entire report for the actual curation scientist. And then the curation scientist goes through all the critical uh, variants and does a manual check to be ACMG compliant uh, and double check quality. And then we have some algorithms in place to avoid any kind of false positives and problems. Um, but there's a huge, huge amount of work that the computer or the cloud does for the AI. Yes. Because you have to, I mean, these are non-trivial little problems, right? You have. You get a giant file out that, that can have millions of variants, uh, at least hundreds of thousands, and you technically have to revisit like every single variant and go through you know five areas of dimensions that all count up to like up to twenty eight different dimensions. You have to check for each single variant, you know, population frequency, uh, protein impact and change, uh, the publications and reference materials. You have to read through. For every single variant, if you multiply this with 100,000, you're not getting anywhere. So what the AI and cloud can do is highly automate this process and that adds tremendous efficiencies, but also tremendous quality improvements. Because what you don't want is to do this manually because there's too many human errors that can go in. Yeah, certainly. Yeah, and that's certainly. just a lot of work because you think of all the data that's coming out of this. Um, and then if you're going on the whole genome side, I mean, even more data going through that. So certainly a lot to sort through. But I just want to thank you so much for coming on the show and just sharing all your insight with whole exome sequencing. I think it's really cool to see. I mean, just where we are today just blows my mind. But then thinking about where we could be in the near future. So thank you so much for, you know, sharing all that today. And where can people find out more about yourself and quant gene? Yeah, of course, on quantine.com. That's always good. You can go to my personal Twitter. I'm trying to tweet a little bit more. Uh, not succeeding yet, but soon. At twitter.com slash Joe Bhakti. Uh, and then we have you know, our LinkedIn page if you're interested in jobs uh, or general news. Uh, 
you know, on LinkedIn, if you look for quarantine, um, yeah, that's, that's the main sources. Fantastic. And we're going to include all of that in the show notes for today's episode, which is available if you're listening to this as a podcast. Um, if you just swipe right or up or depending on the different podcast app you're using, all the information is also available at dnapodcast.com. You can connect with us on Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, Facebook by searching DNA Today. And any questions for myself or Joe, feel free to send into info at dnapodcast.com. We are happy to answer your questions. And one favor before we let you go, um, please rate and review on Apple. We'd really appreciate that. That's how more people can find out about the show. So thanks for listening, everybody. And join us next time to learn and discover new advances in the world of genetics.